All right. Our next performer, we're actually is appearing. I guess maybe you could say in uh, exhibition, not even on the official Joko Cruise performers and guests list. That's right. Flying in, uh, we, we traded uh, to the, the Canadian League to bring this guy in. Will you please welcome your next Not My Day Job performer, Chris Clue. I'm just from that, because I'm a terrible singer. Um, however, I am going to be doing a worst first chapter. Yeah. Yes. Now, just a little bit of background on this worst first chapter. Um, I had happened to mention to Cruz Mom at, I think, lunch today, how I had an idea for a worst first chapter, and you know, it'd be cool if I could get a chance to do it at some point. Me thinking, maybe next cruise, maybe two years from now, maybe three years from now. <laughs> At 5 o'clock when I got back from uh, snorkeling with my kids, there was a message on my phone. And it said, hey, Chris, heard you wanted to do a Worst First Chapter. This is Paul. Uh, can you have it ready by 7 o'clock? And I was like, uh, yeah, yeah, I can do that. So I, uh, I wrote a Worst First Chapter in about an hour. So bear that in mind as, as you listen to this. Um, now, how many people in here are fans of science fiction? Fans of military science fiction books. All right, there you go. How many people know those old Bayon covers where you have, you know, the guy in the space suit with the gun and he's shooting at like a llama or something and the parts are like vaguely shiny and you don't know why? I want you to picture that cover as I am reading you this first chapter. Okay? All right, so here we go. Where's the first chapter? This is the third book in the space opera series, Her Majesty's Royal Space Brigade. Parentheses, The Succession Wars of Trendinus Prime. Title not yet decided. <laughs> All right. Captain Irvington Schnubnob III gazed down at the repeater plot in his 10 meter wide by 8 meter long command cabin of the light heavy frigate cruiser Napoleon Bonaparte and wondered just when it was things in his life went so bad. As the second son of a third son of a fourth daughter of a fifth uncle of the gardener to Her Majesty's dog groomer, joining Her Majesty's Royal Space Brigade was meant to solve his problems, not create new ones. Yet here he was again, staring down a combined fleet of bricks, ticks, and tricks ships from the Captain Crunch Nebula, numbering at least a thousand strong. Don't be imprecise, he thought to himself. It's exactly 1,348 ships, and they all want you dead. This posed a problem for Irvington because he rather fancied staying alive. Then you better figure out a way to make that happen, he continued thinking to himself, going over all the tools at his disposal. After battling through dire odds and conquering the Weberbane Armada three months, 26 days, 13 hours, 57 minutes, and 12 seconds prior, Irvington's flotilla of cruisers, battle cruisers, star cruisers, galaxy cruisers, tenders, tendies, and a lone burrito merchant went in there and in the mix was looking more ragged than the drive plume of a heavily, but not too heavily damaged, Nifheim Space Penetrator Mark IV, the one with the second flux shaft upgrade package, not the original. <laughs> After traveling 4,826,399 kilometers on a single flux core. All right. Fortunately, Irvington knew that his crew of 2,574 trained spacers who he never knew the names of, even when writing the casualty reports after yet another bloody but miraculously survivable battle in the depths of cold vacuum at relativistic speeds, were more than up to the task, not least of which, not least of which because they were led by him and his command team. First among that team was his tactical officer, Lieutenant Calculates a Lot of Vectors, who <laughs> still at the targeting plot was by now legendary. It was she who had determined that the Void Maw of Breveté was exactly 8,357,012 kilometers away from the wandering star of Lost Edits, and used that information to deliver a devastating salvo of destruction onto the Usurper fleet before they could threaten Her Majesty's vital weapons manufactories. And without those weapons manufactories, Irvington continued, continued thinking to himself, <laughs> Chief Gunnery Major Sergeant Private Rock Hardnuts wouldn't keep our <laughs> and 67 primary tubes, 321 secondary tubes, and three tertiary tubes, loaded with the finest kinetic accelerators this side of the spiral, spiral line, which measures 12 parsecs, 28 parsecs, 13 triple secs, and 54 angry secs across. Natural. Of course it's natural, I'm thinking this to myself. 
Irvington, of course, was envisioning the Thunder Missile X-ray Detonated Autonomous Cluster Laser Rocket Maser Phaser, any one of which could blow up a planet no larger than 23,631 kilometers in diameter with a single strike of its liquid, argon-cooled, vapor-titanium-heated solid hydrogen-fueled primary beam. <laughs> If the target survived an initial strike, the secondary blast, composed of exotic particles, refracted through a 390-degree circle, whose providence even Irvington was unsure of, were certain to finish the job. However, since the Thunder Missile X-ray detonated autonomous cluster laser rocket maser phaser traveled at a top speed of 417,825 kilometers per hour, cruising speed 270,511 kilometers per hour, loitering speed 161,971 kilometers per hour, there were very few targets who could even think of escaping the primary beam, so it was rare to actually see the effects of the secondary blast. It's a good thing engineer mechanic Gritty McTrope keeps our armor maintained. <laughs> Irvington continued, 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 thinking to himself. Otherwise, we'd be vulnerable to being completely destroyed by an enemy's thunder missile X-ray detonated autonomous cluster laser rocket maser phaser, instead of just losing non-critical but heavily staffed crew segments of the ship. <laughs> The sound of his communications officer, Gertrude, suddenly interrupted Irvington's thoughts. <laughs> Captain, the Grits and Picks and Tricks commander is hailing us. Put it on my main screen, Irvington growled, staring at the only screen in the room. <laughs> Let's see what this mongrel has to say. A squirming mass of tentacles, topped by a crown of sensory orbs, appeared on the screen, appearing to almost thrust itself through the intervening space, in a sound like 10,384 puppies being shoved into 10,384 wood chippers simultaneously blasted through the room. Irvington recoiled, disgusted by the clearly evident evilness on display in front of him, because by God, if cultural norms weren't universal, then that was a universe he just didn't want to think existed. <laughs> There would be no reasoning with the grits and fixin' and tricks. I've heard enough, he snarled, fists clenching on top of the repeater plot. The screen returned to its original dull gray. Lieutenant Alana Vectors, on my mark, prepare to fire 27 Thunder Missile X-ray Detonated Autonomous Cluster Laser Rocket Maser Phasers at full spread, 53 Thunder Missile X-ray Detonated Autonomous Cluster Laser Rocket Maser Phasers at medium spread, and 12 Thunder Missile X-ray Detonated Autonomous Cluster Laser Rocket Maser Phasers at tight spread. Irvington switched the channel to a shipwide ban. Listen up, crew, he thundered. Today we fear no death, except the death we fear, but fear not. I'm in the armored command center, so I'm definitely going to survive this thing. <laughs> Remember, we fight for God, Her Majesty, and all the obsessively detailed speeds, distances, casualty counts, and munition descriptions I have left to think about. Fire! <laughs>